Thank you so much. It's good to be back and uh, good to see you today. I thought all of Hawaii was in Los Angeles airport. I mean, it was like, wow, when I was trying to get here. But uh, God gave, us a, a safe, gave me a safe flight. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, worship team. What a beautiful way to set up the service for Easter. You even quoted some of the scriptures I'm going to quote. So I just love the way that the Lord makes that happen. It's, uh, um, we're talking about portraits for Easter. And uh, we'll be in Matthew's Gospel. So if you want to turn to Matthew's Gospel, we'll be in uh, basically Matthew 26 and 27. And uh, I want to talk to you about, you know, Easter portraits. When uh, we still do them in our family. Every Easter we have to dress special and then we get a picture after Easter lunch. Now, let me see. Admit if you do that, okay? Anita, do you make your family take an Easter portrait? Not anymore, but you know, you used to take your kids when they were young and they had to get a portrait and we, we look through the pictures and that's the time I wore the blue shirt, that's the time I wore the other shirt. And we just watch how we're growing and um, I already saw people at the mall, they're taking their pictures with the Easter bunny. So, you know, a portrait, and I'm not talking about a selfie, you know, you young folks here, all you know is selfies, you know, that, that's a self-portrait and you can touch it up and you can do anything with it or em emojis and memes. I'm talking about the thing where you go maybe to farmer's market and there's someone sitting there and he says, you sit down and for $10 I'll draw your portrait. Now, if you've ever had that done, it never looks as good as you expect it to look. Because he brings out certain things, maybe makes your face a little fatter than you thought, or your eyes are not quite as good as they look. And so a portrait has a way of emphasizing certain qualities and certain characteristics. And what I want us to do this Easter time is look at some of the portraits of the people that are in the Easter story and see what we learn about Easter from those portraits. They are not touched up. They are plain, honest good, bad, and ugly portraits, but they give us hope and they help us in our faith. So um, we're in the book uh, of Matthew. It's the Easter story, and we're going to look at the life of Peter, one of the portraits in this particular story. Now, Peter is not here today, but uh, some things about Peter remind me of Peter. No, I'm just kidding. You can tell him when he gets here. But Peter and Andrew, the original disciples, were some of the first that were responded to the call of Jesus to leave their fishing and become uh, followers of Christ. For three years, they were in the inner circle with Jesus. They heard him teach. They heard him uh, challenge the religious leaders of the day. They watched him heal the sick. They were... Uh, familiar with what it meant when he talked about eternal life. And so Peter had the kind of seat. Is this driving you crazy? Can you hear okay? It's not running you too. But Peter had an inner circle seat. And if anybody has a great portrait of Easter, it ought to be Peter. So in Matthew chapter 16, we're going to just look at this quick portrait here. Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples. He said to them, now, who do you think I really am? You've been around me for three years. Who do you think I really am? And so Peter comes out with this confession and says, You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. You are the living God. And Jesus is like, Yes, you nailed it. You nailed it. And it wasn't something you got from your own intelligence. It's something that was revealed to you. This is Matthew 16, verses 15 and 16. You nailed who I really am. Peter recognized that Jesus was the Messiah. He understood that the Messiah was coming to deliver the religious, the Jewish people, and he envisioned some kind of political takeover where this Messiah would come and deliver the people from the Romans. And Peter had it all figured out, and he said, Jesus, you are the Messiah. But then Jesus clarified what that meant. Matthew 16, verse 21. And from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be murdered, killed. And on the third day, he would rise again. And Peter, although he confessed Jesus was the Messiah, did not believe what, Je what Jesus just said. Now, you and I are, are reading the story backwards. You know, Peter didn't know what was going to happen. You have some idea of what Peter did and how it all worked out. But when he heard Jesus say that he was going to be killed, rise again on the third day, he couldn't handle it. Jesus used the word here that means murdered in, uh, for the word that we translate as killed. And Peter thought, that can't be right. 
You got it wrong, Jesus. Somebody's not going to murder you. I will not let that happen. And so in verse 22, Peter took him aside. Let's get verse 22 up there. And began to rebuke him. Can you believe that? Telling Jesus he was wrong. And that word rebuke is kind of like a, a, a commanding officer talking to an underling and saying, hey, you got it wrong. And it's, a, the active, it's, a, it's an active tense, which means he kept on saying it. He pulled Jesus aside and he said, you got it wrong. Far be it from you, Lord. Don't let this happen. This shall never happen to you. Can you believe that? He's got some guts. That's a little too bold, folks. To tell Jesus what he just predicted was not going to happen. Peter, in this portrait, doubted the cross was necessary. If you're taking notes, think about that. Write it down. Peter doubted the cross was necessary. Now, that's hard for us to imagine. He kept on saying it to Jesus. He loved Jesus so much he didn't want to lose Jesus. He doubted the cross was necessary. He thought there was another way to, to bring about his rulership in a political sense, in a military sense. He thought he knew better than Jesus. He did not understand God's plan. And Jesus turned to him and look what he said. Jesus turned to him and he said, Get behind me who? Satan. This is the only person in the Bible that Jesus calls Satan. He called the religious, religious leaders whitewashed tombs and he told them they were hypocrites. But only Peter got this title of Satan. You're a hindrance to me. For you're not seeing, you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Folks, this is harsh language. Peter, in this portrait of Easter, thought the cross was unnecessary. There was another way around it. And Jesus said... Make no mistake, there's no way of getting around the cross. And it reminded, I believe, the Lord Jesus of a, the occasion when he was in the wilderness and Satan came to him and he said, Hey, I know what's ahead. You've come to redeem the human race and to restore what was lost in the Garden of Eden. You've come to bring a reconciliation between God and, and the human race. You've come to sacrifice your life on the, on the cross, Jesus knew what lay ahead. Satan had an idea of what was coming. And he said, I tell you what, I've got a shortcut for you. If you will just bow down. Now get the picture. It's in the wilderness. And Jesus has been about 40 days there on his own. Satan says, I've got a shortcut for you. You bow down and worship me. And I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. And what did Jesus say to Satan? It is written... You worship the Lord your God and Him only you serve. And He wouldn't let anything stand between Him and the cross. So here's Peter, disciple number one in lots of people's minds today. And he gets the title Satan because he doubted the cross was necessary. And there are a lot of people... And maybe some in this room who doubt the cross was really necessary. In America, there used to be, what, four or five holidays? Christmas, Easter, Labor Day, July the 4th, you know, Thanksgiving. And now when you look at your Google calendar, your Apple calendar, there's every holiday that you've never heard of and can't even pronounce on there. And the uniqueness of Easter... The specialness of the cross has become something in great doubt in people's minds. Now, we want to encourage you to invite, to invite some people to be with you here on Easter Sunday. It's going to be an incredible service. People are more open to coming to worship on Easter than any other time, but people are increasingly doubting the importance of the cross. See, like Peter, they have their own plan. If there's another way... You do it the other way, Jesus. This doesn't sound good. So I'm going to work my way to heaven. And hopefully the good works will outweigh the bad works. And God's going to let me in because he's a loving God. So he can't really send anybody to hell, can he? Especially someone who's lived a good moral life. Or if I don't make it in this life, I'll go to a place called purgatory. And if you'll pray for me really hard, I'll get out of purgatory eventually. And I'll end up in the presence of God forever. 
And if I don't do it this time, I'll do it next time and when I'm reincarnated. And there are a lot of people who doubt the need for the cross. They think religious activity, church attendance, Bible reading even, can substitute the cross. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no way to get around it, Peter. You can doubt it, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. So how do you feel about Easter this year? Is it just one more holiday and you're like, man, let's get it over and done with? Or is it the heart of your faith that if you didn't have the cross, you would not be here this morning? And it's not just the cross we remember once a year. It's a cross that we live by and we think about. We follow Jesus who said, if anyone comes after me, and this is one of the next verses here. He, he, he said, if anyone comes after me in Matthew 16, 24, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So there's a daily cross that we take as we follow Christ. And Peter got it wrong. So how do you feel about your faith? Is it a do-good faith? Do it yourself. You know, you get a few do-it-yourself books that go along with the Bible and you're everything's good. You know, God is good. God is good all the time. That's true, but Christianity is a lot more than that. How important is the cross to you? Mistake number one, Peter doubted the cross. Mistake number two, he doubted that he could fail. He thought he had a fail proof faith. And now we're into chapter 26. It's the last week of Jesus' life. They're all in Jerusalem. Peter's beginning to see the tide of opinion change. The, the religious leaders are stirring up the crowd and there are hundreds of thousands of people there for Passover. We talked about it at 845 in the time we had in, in, our, in our lesson this morning. And Jesus then has the last supper with his disciples. He identifies Judas as the one who's going to betray him. The disciples are arguing about who's the greatest and who's the best. There's a lack of humility in the room. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Matthew 26, verse 30, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, that Mount of Olives that overlooks Jerusalem. And verse 31 of Matthew 26, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it's written, he quotes Zechariah, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will all be scattered. You're all going to fail. But after I am raised up, I'll see you in Galilee. Okay? And Peter, Matthew 26, 33, answered him and says, Though they all fall, fail, fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Wow. He didn't think he could ever fail. Jesus said everyone was going to fail, but he, he doubted that. And Jesus said to him in verse 34, Truly I tell you this, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me once, twice, and three times. And Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And everybody else said the same. So now Peter accepts the cross is going to happen and maybe a little bit more. He didn't doubt it so much. But he never doubted that his faith would be strong. And he doubted that he could ever fail. His loyalty to Jesus was full proof. In fact, greater than any other disciple. And that's why we all need a, a lesson from Peter this morning. It's the one that Paul gave us in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. If you don't have it, write it down. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he... My little grandson, he's on the back of the couch and he's jumping up and down the couch. I said, stop jumping, you're going to fall off. He said, I'll never fall off. And he keeps jumping and keeps jumping until he... He stands thinking he's never going to fall, but he falls because he doesn't think he can fall. So let me ask you this. What is the one thing you think you could never fail at? What is that one thing you think you would never do? 
it might be the area that you're most vulnerable in. Through the years, I've had the privilege of talking to men who unfortunately have been, been unfaithful to their wives. And most of them tell me somewhere in the conversation, this is the one thing I thought would never happen to me. Well, maybe a marriage breaks up and people come for pastoral counsel and they say, we never dreamed we'd be here or a divorce would be in our future. Maybe that's because they didn't think they could ever fail. Now, I don't have to go around thinking I'm going to fail in my marriage all the time, but if I think I could never fail in my marriage, then I'm committing the same mistake Peter committed. You know, when I say to people, what's the one sin that most of you could never commit? And everybody would say, I would never murder anyone. I mean, the thought of you taking a, a gun and shooting someone innocently, I mean, that's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. This is mm-hmm. But what did Jesus say? If you look at someone in anger and speak harshly and in anger, you have committed murder. Because it's not just the action, it's the inner thought. You say, I'll always be faithful to my spouse, but if you have an unfaithful mind and you're drawn away by pornography, then you have committed that sin. So let's all take heed when we think we stand and we can't fall off the couch because that's the next thing that's going to happen. A few hours later, Peter's public convictions are put to the test. And folks, it was a bad night. It was a miserable night. It was the worst night of his life. They've gone to the Mount of Olives. They're in Gethsemane, the garden. Jesus says, you stay here and I'll go over here and pray. And Peter falls asleep, along with the others that were close by. And then Jesus on, is on trial before the high priest. And Peter is, gets in there. John helps him get inside to the temple courtyard. It's a really cold night, and so he's sitting by the fire, and he's warming himself, and he's trying to be unnoticed. Anybody here today trying to be unnoticed? You've been places where you wished they didn't know you were there? <laughs> Want to fade into the wallpaper, you know, that kind of thing. So he's, he, he's trying to be unnoticed, and the high priest servant, she looks at him, and we always think she's maybe a, just a younger person, and she says to him, you were with Jesus the Galilean, weren't you? And before he can say it, he says, I don't know what you're talking about. Matthew 26, verse 69. Now folks, this is an uncomfortable thing for us to read because we see a little bit of ourselves in this story, don't we? It's uncomfortable for me. And then... Peter was uncomfortable. He's like, I can't let this happen again. So he goes outside and he, he's in the corridor or by the gate. And another woman saw him and said, this man was with Jesus the Nazarene. That's a derogatory term, Nazarene. It's a small town from nowhere. And he denies it. But this time he says, I deny it with an oath on a stack of Bibles. I, I, I'm gonna, I swear to you that I don't know who you're talking about. What? Peter? Is this the portrait of you? And then someone comes and says, it's your accent that gives you away. I have an accent. People say, where are you from? <laughs> your accent's giving you away, Peter. Look at verse 74 of Matthew 26. This is unbelievable. And then he began to invoke a curse. He started cussing and he said, I don't know this man. That's uncomfortable for me to read it for Peter, but it's uncomfortable for all of us because there's a little bit of this in all of us. Or we've all had this kind of situation where we haven't been as strong as we thought we were going to be. And it's stunning that after he started, doubted the cross, said, I'll never desert you. He denies Jesus publicly three times. And immediately, I can't do a rooster sound. Anybody do it? That's it. The rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, 
you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. When the test came, his faith failed him. And at that moment, he was so overwhelmed with doubts about himself and his faith and what he had done. He had denied his Savior. And there's a kind of special specialness in this room this morning because Peter's not the first or the last one that's been in that kind of situation. And I'm not looking at anybody here, but all of us can remember a time when we let Christ down. It could have been last week. You used bad language because you thought, nobody knows me and it's okay to speak this way and I'm not trying to win any of these people to Christ and so your language was like Peter's and it was in contradiction to your faith what comes out of your mouth shows what's in your heart or maybe you had a question about what you believe and you kind of dodged the question because you didn't want to get into the fact that you you have faith and that's what drives you well, maybe you were in an uncomfortable situation. You should not have been there. You know you shouldn't have been there. And you tried to pretend you weren't there, but you were there. And by being there, you denied your Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you got in an argument this week with those that you love, your kids, your spouse, and you said some ungodlike things. And you denied your faith by the way you spoke and so there's a degree to which we all find ourselves in this place today where Peter was before we become too hard on Peter let's let's admit it and let's talk about what we do when our faith is overwhelmed by doubt you see suddenly all that Peter felt he was so bold about was gone and these doubts led him to compromise and to to deny and to his core values and if you're struggling with doubt and compromise and maybe you feel like you've let Christ down this week let me make some suggestions that I think will help us all first of all identify the source of it you see the reason Peter failed there were many of them but the first one was he, he was mistaken about the facts he couldn't quite see how Jesus had to go through what he went through. And so even though he stayed close, he denied that he was a part of what Jesus was doing because he couldn't understand God's plan. And so he was mistaken about the facts. Sometimes we get mistaken about the facts. We think, okay, Lord, I'm saved. I love you. I serve you, so I shouldn't suffer. Mm-mm. That's part of the cross and taking up the cross and following him. We understand suffering in a different way from those that do not have faith. Jesus said, take heart. In this world you will have tribulation, but I have overcome the world. So identify the source of your, your failure, your denial, your doubt. In Peter's case, there was peer pressure. And these were just young girls who didn't know who he was, but he was afraid because there were Roman gods that were there at some point, and then there were the Jewish temple police, and it was kind of a dangerous place to be, so he didn't want to get in the same position as Jesus was in. So identify the source. Is it peer pressure? Is it pride? The, the book of Proverbs says that pride goes before a fall, Proverbs 16, verse 18, and, and Peter was prideful, and he didn't really know what was going to happen. But the great news is, and this is the news for all of us today, Peter's faith grew stronger through this failure. Anybody have a failure in your faith? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because we don't have enough hands. But we have failed. But here's the thing. In when our failure drives us to weeping and to remorse and to a sense of, fa of needing to come back to Christ. How do we grow through that failure? We have to be convinced about the cross. Convinced about the cross. The cross on which Christ Jesus died. 
Now we know that John went to the cross. We don't know what Peter did. But we know that on the first day of the week, when the tomb was empty and the women called the disciples to come and look, Peter ran and he ran faster than John and he got inside the tomb and when he looked inside the tomb, he found it was empty and he said, yes, Jesus did rise from the dead. And so all those things he had doubted and all the things he had doubted about himself suddenly became real and true for him and he became convinced about the cross because he saw the resurrection of Christ through the empty tomb. So there's a cross, but there's also an empty tomb. There's a resurrected Savior. Are you convinced that this happened for you on a day in history so that you could be freed from your sin and reconciled to God and it doesn't matter if you fail and you don't intend to fail but there's always restoration because of the cross of Christ and then there's a beautiful time in John's gospel chapter 21 where Jesus is by the sea getting breakfast ready for them they're out fishing and they haven't caught anything he said oh put your nets down and you'll get a big catch and they do and Peter sees Jesus and recognizes that's just like another miracle Jesus had done. And he's the first out of the boat and he leaves the other disciples to bring all the fish and he runs to Jesus and he's... I wonder what he thought Jesus was going to say to him. Of course, it's the resurrected Jesus now and he says, come and have breakfast, folks. They must have had some talk among themselves and with Jesus and then at some point in that breakfast, Jesus stops and he says, now, Peter, I have a question for you. It's not about why did you deny me. It's not a question about how come you didn't stay true to your word. It's not a question about why are you so proud or why did you submit to prayer pressure. It's a question about Peter, do you what? Love me. Because that's really what the cross is about. It's about God so loved the world that he gave his only son that we should not perish but have eternal life. And he wants us to love him and the greatest sign of love in this world is not the person who tells you they love them, love you in this human race, but it's the love of God in, expressed in the cross of Christ. So it says, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter, do you love me more than all these things? And Peter's starting to get frustrated. And he says, Lord, you know that I love you. And Peter says, and Jesus says to him, that will feed my sheep. And in that beach scene, Peter is restored and experiences the love of Christ. And the three times he tells Jesus he loves him, I think mirror the three times he says he denied him. And his faith is restored. And it's not a faith in just a cross. It's a faith in the person of Christ who died on the cross for his sin and then Peter becomes the great preacher of the cross when the church is born on the day of Pentecost he preaches and it's an incredible sermon it's in Acts chapter 20 chapter 2 verse 36 and in the middle of the sermon he says let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and and Christ this Jesus whom who you crucified there's a sense in which all of our sins put Jesus on the cross but it's this cross of Christ that was given to us so that Jesus was both Lord and Christ would become the Savior for our sins and so Peter it says later on, there is salvation found in no, one, no other, Acts 4, 12. No other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Peter, was that a real restoration? It was. You preached and thousands of people responded. And then when the church went through suffering and it was dispersed, you wrote a letter to the churches and we call them first and second Peter. And in that letter, you talk about trials and how we go through those trials. And you talk about the cross. And while I think you quoted this verse, if not this one, the next one. First Peter 3.18, he says this. For Christ also suffered once for sins. Once and for all, no other time needed. 
the righteous, that's Jesus, for the unrighteous, that's us, and our sins, that he might bring us to God, put us together, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Peter, you figured out the cross. So you can explain it in one of the most profound verses in the Scripture. Uh, 1 Peter 2 and verse 24. A few verses later, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. So you may have a few doubts this morning. You know, there's a misnomer out there that just because you're a Christian and you have faith, you shouldn't have any doubt. The reason you have faith is because you have some doubts. And if you take away all the doubts, there's no need for faith. If you don't follow that, I'd, I'd love to share that with you a little bit more. But because there's a little doubt out there, I need faith. And because I have faith, I overcome my doubts. And, and Peter, you overcame your doubts about the cross to where you could say what Jesus did and encourage a persecuted, dispersed church through all that. And a Christian needs to understand the cross of Christ and then as a Christ follower, we need to understand our personal cross. See, this is not an Easter cross, it's a daily cross. If any man come after me, Matthew 16, 24, they should deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. I'm putting in the plural there. So on a daily basis, I have to deny what Jeff Hammond wants and say, Lord, I'm taking up the cross and I'm following you. And it's you that I want to live through me and not me to be trying to do this in my own strength. And later on, Paul would say in Galatians 6.14, Far be it from me to boast in anything except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And then one of my life verses, Galatians 2.20, would you read it with me? I have been with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but and the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I've been crucified to the cross. My desires, my doubts, my will, my purpose. And now I live, but I don't live this life in my own strength. I live this life through Christ who lives through me. The Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. Well, Peter, was it a bed of roses for you? Everything go well after that one failure? Mm -mm. Jesus kind of predicted how Peter would die in John 21, verses 18 and 19. You can look there yourself, but let me tell you how Peter died. AD 24, there's a tremendous persecution in Rome. And there's a Nero is persecuting the Christians. And Peter gets caught up in all that, and he's actually killed as a martyr for his faith. And tradition in our church history tells us this, that they did stretch out his hands. Jesus said, when you die, someone's going to stretch out your hands. And uh, that was, I think, pointing to the fact that he would be crucified. But church tradition tells us that when they came to crucify Peter, and I can't imagine a more painful death, He said, don't crucify me head up, but crucify me head down because I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Savior was crucified. Wow. What a portrait for Easter. And Jesus never promised us a bed of roses. He never promised it would all be easy. He never promised you'd never be challenging your faith. He even is going to be there when you mess up. And he's always going to ask you, do you love me? And do you love me so much so that you crucify yourself every day and allow me to live through you? So as we think about your portrait this Easter, 
How does it compare to last year spiritually? How do you look in terms of your walk with Christ this year as opposed to last year? Hopefully it's stronger, it's better. If you messed up some, you've, you've restored that by repentance and asking forgiveness. If Jesus was to paint your portrait of your Christian faith today, what would you not like about it? No, Lord, that's not. But yes, it is, he says. What do you need help with changing? A style, a look, a way, a walk, a talk. And I'm not talking about a self-touch-up, okay? You want to see what teenagers can do with a, a selfie. <laughs> they make it look so different, it's not them. I'm talking about a real portrait that Christ would paint of my faith and yours. How would you change it? What is he showing you today? And how will this Easter be different beginning right now? Would you pray with me?